This is Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome back to the Cyber Underground. I'm your host, Dave Stevens. Glad wow. to have you here. Let me introduce my exceptional co-host, Andrew, the security guy. Hey, what's up, everybody? Aloha. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, what are we going to talk about today? Let's talk about Brian Krebs right off the off I the love bat. Brian Krebs. He's a wonderful. Uh, uh, what's his website? Brian uh, Brian Krebs. I Krebs on security. Yeah, Krebs on security. Krebs on security. Yeah. Uh, I was there this morning, and I was reading, of course, about the boarding pass. Yeah. The boarding pass, uh, it, if our friends out there don't know, the boarding pass, uh, you get the, uh, you know, all the details of your flight, your gate, the information when you're going to depart, when you're, when you're boarding, and the ubiquitous barcode at the that, bottom. It's got that barcode on there. Uh, but like, nobody was checking it out, I guess. So now there's a website you can go on and actually look at the barcode and see what it actually says, that 2D barcode. And it comes up with, well, different airlines put different information in there, yeah. right? And do you keep your bar, your, your boarding no, my pass? My wife is rabid about shredding those. <laughs> she grabs them from me, and she, <laughs> at the end of every trip we take, she actually shreds them at the office. That's good. Uh, so what they were saying, uh, Brian Krebs said there's a security researcher who went over the barcodes and went through a couple of airlines. One was Lufthansa, and they not only had the person's name and the other information, but also had their... Uh, locator code for the Lufthansa system that you could use to walk through the forgot my pin feature on their website. Nice. Then you could log in oh, as yeah. that person and see not only that flight. And you could so with that with that locator code you could log in and then change the password to your account. You could unchange your Re pin. Request it, right? Right. You could request yeah. that. You could also yeah. see all your future flights, cancel or change flights <laughs> and change seats. <laughs> that would just be malicious. Yeah, and if you have your credit card stored in there, they could upgrade you to first class, and you'd never know until oh. it was too late, right? You get a ten thousand dollars. Oh, so you could take full full control of the person's full of command control. Account. Yeah. Uh, now, American Airlines wasn't as bad, but United Airlines seems to put a very important identifier in there. Your um, what do they call the the mileage number? Your account. Oh, your frequent flyer frequent number. Frequent flyer number. They put that in there, and that seems to be an ultra secret code. Hmm. So you don't even see that on your on your United Airlines statements mm -hmm. or bills, but that is your unique identifier in their database. Mm. So once you have that, you have complete uh, ability to go in and monitor or control. Yeah, I guess if you were to call on the phone and say, I'm done so and so, I need to change my password, or whatever, you might be able to work that if out. If you had that number, yeah, they they might there's volumes. Yeah, because I, I don't fly United. I, some of the other airlines ask for some additional information that, that you would have to have given them. So if you had the boarding pass, you probably have a lot of information. Oh, I don't know what's on <laughs> what's on the other one. <laughs> well, you, you got the gate, the flight, the time, the day, uh, with the, the when you're going to board, your name, first, middle, last, uh, if you're TSA pre-check. I mean, it's got a lot of great information. Yeah, there. that's printed. Mine, those print on mine, the airline I fly. Yeah. The number prints up there, TSA pre-check, I think. Oh, yeah, thank God for that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't believe how much time I save on a TSA pre. That yeah. was uh, money well spent. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you guys haven't done that, go do that. Yeah, it's free if you get a <laughs> Platinum Amex. Really? Well, I wouldn't have known that. <laughs> so now we know that uh, you somebody get, you, you know. You get has. these free ones. <laughs> you got to get stuff for free. Or it might have been the, it's not that, it's the, what's it, Global Entry. Sorry. Global Entry, what is this? Global Entry is the international one. So where yeah. you just go to the kiosk, you're registered, you, you give them all your info, and then you, your biometrics, and then when you come through, you just go to the kiosk and testify that you don't, you're not bringing any, any guns or weapons or drugs or whatever they ask, and you just put your hand or take your face, and you go. I love those questions, as if I would ever say, yeah, I've got a bag <laughs> here with yeah, a gun well, in it. Yeah, while I'm standing in customs. Yeah, uh, here's my C4. Uh, <laughs> can I get that through? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. I, I, uh, I, yeah, so I, I'm a, I'm a fan of being registered and letting them know who I am. I think that helps you out if you're, um, you ever got to go to the embassy because you lose your passport when you're traveling or whatever. You know, you should always sure. contact the State Department. I mean, I'm big on being trans, sort of transparent, at least to our government about myself because I'm not to up to anything government. bad. You yeah. know? Well, that, that's what the government services are set up for, right? Yeah. Foreign, foreign, uh, foreign contact and sure. us going to other countries. And uh, I thought it was pretty neat. I could go to another country, show my passport, and get onto a Navy ship. Awesome. Get a tour. Nice. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was their a, Navy or our Navy? Our Navy. Now they're. I was going <laughs> to say. They're a little, they're a little stodgy about that, you know. And well, some like, of them have beer. Ours don't have any beer. <laughs> like the Aussies. We used to see the Aussies out at sea. They'd have all these kegs strapped on the they're side of the boat. Fosters on tap. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a limit, like two pints a day or something. 
they limit that? That's the Aussies. That's the, that's <laughs> I'm just heresy. guessing. I don't know. They, <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, companies and how they can comply nowadays. Um, there's always been these rules. So mm. decades ago, the government came up with rules. You've been dealing with these for a long time in your business, right? The, uh, the DFARS. Oh, know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm a rule breaker, but, you know. <laughs> when you do business with... Um, uh, the entities in the government, yeah. the Defense Logistics Agency, the DOD, the Air Force, Army, whatever. There's always rules about how you have to secure your systems. Your it used to be information systems, mm -hmm. now they just say systems. Yeah. Before you connect to a government system, or even if they just send you information that they can consider CUI, controlled unclassified information. Sure. Which doesn't seem like a big deal. If you think it's unclassified, why should it be controlled? And someone gave me a great example of uh, if you had, say, uh, a floor plan of every building on a base, so that floor plan for one building, no big deal, right? It's sensitive, but if it got out, it wouldn't really hurt anybody. But if you had every single floor plan of every single building on a single base, you could probably figure out where things were. You'd know where the high-ranking people were because of the big offices. You'd know where some of the storage facilities mm -hmm. were, probably the armory, mm -hmm. probably where some of the big big vehicles like tanks are, right? You could figure that out. And you could see mm -hmm. how far away from the fence they were, how, you know, your ingress and egress points and mm -hmm. points of attack and so forth. And utilities, right? So that becomes sensitive information at sure. that point, right? If you compile a whole bunch of that. So that's what these rules are meant to prevent is yeah. people getting a lot of this stuff out. So they developed a rule set for federal systems by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, yes. which has been around for a couple of decades. You want to go to NIST.gov, yes. and you can look all these rules up. And they're uh, part of the Department of Commerce, interestingly enough. Oh, I enough. did not know commerce. Oh, I would yeah. not have guessed. Yeah. Uh, okay. It was better than Treasury, I guess. Yeah. But, um, well, they, that makes so, sense. So the Department of oh. Commerce works well with, the, with uh, industry and um, university systems oh, okay. to do stuff for the government. You know, if the government doesn't play, doesn't play well. That's why NASA was involved in NIST when they first stood it I up. I think so. Yeah. Um, so they developed these rule sets, and one of them was, uh, and they numbered them. This one's 800-53, mm -hmm. and it's in revision four or draft. And it's a list of rules that you have to comply with to configure your systems to be able to be secure enough to hold this information yes. to a reasonable assurance level that you're not going to lose it. Mm -hmm. And there's different levels. You could be a low, moderate, or high risk. Right. And if you're moderate, which is usually what everybody is, you have to comply with these rules. Now, in 2015, they came out with a subset of the 853. So that parent document was for federal systems. Right, for the executive right. branch and right. DOD and those guys. Some, some guidance those for federal are systems. The guidance. Sure. So it's very hard for non-federal systems to come up to that standard. There's 200 some odd controls. It's too expensive. <laughs> it's way, yeah, it's, it's way too hard. So they made a subset of the rules, a little bit less than half of the rules. you got to comply with 109 of them, and that's 800-171. Yeah. And that's the new rules that you have to comply with. Now, they came out with this in 2015. I think there was some objection. Uh, the, the SBA went to fight, and a lot of lobby organizations, small business just wasn't ready to even absorb something, the lighter weight set of controls. You know, it's, ex it's expensive to implement, to go through the process of implementation, and people just weren't ready. So uh, it was great guidance, and um, the small business, uh, I guess, made enough pushback to the Fed that the Fed said, okay, uh, we'll take, they, they, they actually pulled some stuff back and changed some of the stuff about wireless and a few things in it, and then reissued it. And gave us a deadline, which is the end of this year. Yes, 31 December, and, and that's a hard one. It, uh, the document says you can lose your contract. Yeah. At the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty draconian. And I, is, is well, I think the that. I think the the interesting thing for me was um, they expanded. They took out information systems, as you, as you mentioned, and uh, made that verb it's systems, which immediately impacted the things I do, which are low voltage security systems, right? So that's right. a piece of that now that's subject to that. Uh, that guidance. Um, additionally, um, they uh, they uh, the control itself. The 171 guidance is actually underneath DFARS, right? So your federal acquisition regulations. So it's defense federal acquisition regulations, regulations right? DFARS. And and there's a certain code. It ends in 7012. I forget the other numbers. But if you if you have that in your contract today, in fact, you, it, you, you don't have to wait till the end of the year. You're supposed to be compliant today. Right now. So, it, yeah, so it's actually active. 
Um, the government is just definitely going to start identifying the material it gives you as CUI. There's a, there's a CUI registry where you can go and look at the different types of stamps for the different types of information classification. Um, and then you have, uh, interestingly, there's people like me who create CUI. So my systems, I have to go look at all the stuff that I'm creating on behalf of the work I do with the government, uh, classify it myself, and secure it to the appropriate level. And, and, so, and label it. And label and, it. And, and so label. this is the thing that I think a lot of contractors aren't preparing for um, that I talk to. Well, businesses by their very nature run lean, really lean. Very as lean. lean as they can because they want to maximize the margin, the profits, right? Sure. So these, complying with these rules is an extreme effort. I mean, it's a tremendous effort. I've been it at takes, it for a while getting prepared, a year, <laughs> just learning what it's about, trying to make sure, you know, you know there's a bunch of people you can hire they, they have to charge anywhere from $200,000 to $20,000, <laughs> right? And then, but here's right. the problem with that. If you do that, they have all the knowledge. So inside your own organization, how are you going to know what you've done, how to change it, you know, how are you going to budget for the future? You really, you're at a loss. So we, inside our organization, decided we had to learn, you know, granularly what this is all about. And that's going to help you maintain it. I think so that's over the, time, One of the sure. hardest par parts of this, right? You, you de develop all the controls, you, you comply with all the rules, yeah. and, and then you document them all so you can be audited mm -hmm. at any given time. But then, how often do you update this stuff? Yeah. yeah how often does your organization change? Yeah, so think about it. Every time you, have a, you lose an administrator, you bring one on, or you even lose a, a staff member who may have been in contact with CUI, right? The, the controls over their account, what's your policy for managing those, and right. how quickly are they turned off, and how do you verify that? Um, there's a, a lot more to this than most people think, and it's not, it's definitely not something, if you're just starting today, you're not going to make it anyway by the end of the year. There's no, I don't, it would be tough. you might be brilliant and, <laughs> and, and you might get it, but uh, this is my opinion. You're way, way late if you don't know what 800-171 is, and it isn't just the contractor. Here's an important thing that they don't understand. I just sat in a nice long webinar by a couple of lawyers talking about that flow down mm. and the responsibility of flow down through the supply chain. So, as a contractor, if I'm contracting directly to Gov, and then I've got subcontractors under me that may be exposed to this information, now I've got to be responsible for them right. and their compliance. Well, that makes you wonder who you want to dance with and who you don't want to dance with, right? A including when you when you outsource like your physical security to like uh, like a, a, a patrolman sure. and a guy at the door and a guy at the gate. Now that organization has to feed you the information to comply with those controls. Sure. And now you have to keep checking back with them. Hey, are you still complying with this mm -hmm. control? How are you con complying with the control? Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a little break and uh, come right back. We're going to pay some bills back in about a minute. And we're going to talk about uh, how to implement these things and maintain them, which is not easy. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Doug Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything you, to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back at Cyber Underground. We are talking about the NIST rules for small business, 800-171, the 109 rules you must comply with by the end of this year to do business with the government when you uh, use uh, controlled, unclassified information. Yeah, if, you're, if yeah. it's going to be given to you as part of a contract or if you create controlled, unclassified information in the course of executing on your Storing contract. Storing it using it, consuming sure. it, transporting it. In, in, yeah. in use, in transit, and in storage, yes. Exactly. Right. Uh, so 
let's talk about how we can implement the rules and, and, and how we can off, offload some of those responsibilities. And uh, you're doing something similar right now in your company. There's, sure. You have a storage solution that you want to do, and uh, you have CUI, and you want to push off some of the responsibility for, say, a data center storage solution mm -hmm. to a vendor. And a lot of people go on cloud these days, and sure. there's several vendors out there that say they comply with these rules, and how do they split them up for you? Yeah, so yeah. interestingly, um, you, can, you can download the full suite of, of control documentation for Office 365, for example. Um, and it's got a very high level of assurance with almost every control in 853, which is really good. There are four controls in there that uh, only achieve moderate uh, level of compliance. So, say you're executing at a TS level on a contract, for that's example. That's top secret. Yeah, yeah. You may not be able to use Office 365 in your environment. Right. So, that's something you need to plan for if you're going to pursue top secret contracting work with the government. So, that's one of those things that you, for me, you know, as a small business, you know, we, we've got to look at the, the future budget, the future work that we want to go get and then the systems we have today what what kind of costs could come along with you know chasing a certain award or being awarded some certain work your IT infrastructure cost for protecting that information now have to be a, a you know something you're thinking about and trying to estimate so I have been going around uh, we um, uh, live in an Azure environment today which has some documentation it's a little more difficult to get your hands on um, I'm looking at putting our environment into uh, the government cloud that Amazon operates uh, which is already FedRAMP compliant, and they have a full suite of documentation via, you know, third-party service providers. Mm -hmm. Everything's as good as you pay for. Um, and if, of course, you want to do it on your own, which is I suggest you study this to learn why it is and, and go through the exercise because the, the plugging in of the information into these controls is, is in and of itself not, not that difficult because you can choose to do uh, what it is. For example, if you need to audit all the network devices on your network, for example. You could use NMAP and do an audit, and that may satisfy you. Now that doesn't, you know, that's a one-time point in time, so I don't know right after I did my little scan. That's your snapshot. Yeah, yeah. somebody now somebody might have popped up a, 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 an, Ill, an illicit, you know, Wi-Fi hotspot. One of my employees plugged in a Wi-Fi hotspot or something, and I wouldn't know that unless until I'm monitoring it somewhere else yeah. or until I do the next scan. Right. So, you know, how you choose to implement these tools and, and, and uh, exercise the, um, uh, 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 you know, full suite of controls that are available uh, is, is going to really dictate the sort of the limitations of what you can talk about as far as your own cyber maturity. Now, we're, we're looking at that as a way to differentiate ourselves from our competitors who we don't feel are on the ball with this at all. So that's a great competitive advantage, right? I, to well, say that we sure. actually do this right now. Yeah. We can put that on our contract and we're ready to roll right this second. Yeah, and so the government requires it. But for the rest of the regulated industries that we work for and folks like people that want a high level of assurance out of their supply chain, or if they do government contracting, they can come to me and I can demonstrate the level of maturity that we have. And it's not as easy as just having a policy, you know, a written approved policy that perhaps all of your employees have signed for that they understand that policy. Um, you also have to implement the control itself. You need to monitor that control. Uh, if you can, you need to automate that control and then you need to report upon it. Perhaps it's a, a constant reporting. If something gets outside of a certain threshold, information starts to flow the wrong direction on your network, whatever it may be. So um, there's many steps into that maturity process, and there's many levels of maturity that a, uh, an organization can hope to achieve. And unfortunately, it's not just about the rules, because some of these rules oh, no. have to do with how, what's your disaster recovery Oh, yeah, plan? you have to have your SSP. What's your business yeah. continuity plan? Yep. Uh, what's your change control plan? How do you do employee onboarding and offboarding? Yeah. There's, Configuration management, systems administration manual. You have to make all these things up. Yeah. Sometimes there's nice templates out there, but everything you do is your way, yeah. and it's got to comply with the rules. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and don't do what a lot of people, are, I think, are, are thinking they can get away with, and that's just going out, get your hands on a, a template that worked for someone, and not customizing it to your organization, mm -hmm. because yeah. it, it won't fly. I mean, they're looking for that. There's a ton of people that'll sell you $3,000 template packages and $5,000 template packages, you still got to supply the information. You still got to make decisions about how you're going to implement that control. And that's going to be a cost thing. There's going to be a cost for how you implement, monitor, manage all, all these controls. And these are just the technical controls. 
Right. There's human control There's hu that no, you need to consider. Which are the biggest leak in any organization. Well, once, right? you, once you harden the world, you really get this great hardened, you know, picture. You know, you, you measure up to all the technical controls they've given you. Now you got it. You still got, I think they said that gets you about 85%. And you still got, you got people. And, yeah. So, you know, so training your people, all the stuff that we talk about all the time, you know, this fishing and all that type of awareness training has got to be going on. People have to sign for it. There's insider threat training. There's... It, it, it doesn't end. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing cost to business to operate uh, with, with, you know, a high level of cyber maturity. And you can't just throw a couple of IT people at this. You need <laughs> someone in, in who's mature enough to manage the entire operation from a higher level. Yeah, yeah well, and you need, you need ownership, um, leadership guidance, right? If the ownership is not bought in, they're not going to fund it because they're not going to understand the root of the issue. Now, if I tell them, if we don't do this, we're going to lose our contract, they might go, oh, that might be enough. But that's yeah. pretty lame to me. Like, they really need to understand what this guidance is for. You know, there's NIST uh, uses, has adopted um, but the Baldridge huh. self-assessment. Great tool. It's free for senior management to take that on and see what they know about about the cyber maturity of their organization. But you have to be painfully honest when you fill that out. Very. You can't lie to yourself. Oh, no. Because, it, because the assessment comes out completely wrong. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, you got to tell the truth. Yeah, I mean, gotta, it, any kind of self-assessment, of course, you got to be honest with it. And it's pretty good. I mean, most people couldn't hardly, they're going to either know the answer or, or, or not. The, I think the key, really, in that case, if they don't know it, they need to go the ask answer somebody. is no, yeah. And they, they, I don't know it, that's no. Well, yeah. I better go find out. Sure. Because I'm not passing the muster on this this control. Let's talk about how these controls are broken down. Okay. So how we can knock them out. So uh, 853, the big document for federal systems. Mm -hmm. NIST has 800-171 for small and medium businesses mm -hmm. to do, you know, business with the government and CUI. And we have in that document uh, 109 rules. Yes. Right? So those 109 rules just give you kind of an ambiguous paragraph. This is about what this rule means. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is go to the parent document 853, yeah. and find the associated rule with that sub-rule. So we have uh, 3.1.1 in 800-171. Mm -hmm. It aligns to access control, or AC2, <laughs> in the parent document. AC2 has 11 control checks. Now, that's you, yep. you take the rule and you break it down 11 different ways. These are the things you have to check to make sure you're complying with this rule. In addition, though, after that, there is 15 different checks you have to do to comply with the supplemental guidance that also enhances the controls that you're checking. So if you're not doing it the right way, they're going to tell you, this is the yeah. way we want you to do it. Yeah. And if you're not doing it this way, we humbly suggest you follow our of advice. Of course. Right. And then there's, there's always a large paragraph of more supplemental advice, and you got to read through that and see if any of that applies to you. So you have to go through this identifying the control, mm -hmm. identifying the person who's responsible for the control, mm -hmm. identifying how you're handling it now, mm -hmm. how are you going to change it to comply? What's the gap? Uh, yeah, what's the gap? Yep. And then how are you going to monitor and control that later? And then report upon it. And report it. So you're just in this constant cycle. Mm -hmm. and, and I figured out for very small businesses, um, when you actually implement these, you might spend a thousand man hours trying oh. to nail this down oh, yeah, in the company and document it all. But the ongoing process might cost you five or six hours a week. If yeah. you stay on top of it, it'll probably average yeah. out to about five or six hours a week. And that's an okay cost to deal with. So you get hit in the beginning, but then you can just manage it well. Mm -hmm. And if you document these things well enough, your onboarding process can be, hey, here's our documentation. Read how we do these things. Mm -hmm. Do them this way. And if you see a problem with it and we're not complying, tell us, we'll change it. You need a change control board. You need configuration management mm -hmm. processes. There's a lot of uh, management processes and policies that you have to put in there. So if you're just taking the network monitoring guy, the infrastructure guy, and you're saying, hey, get this done. Yeah, you're not going to have there's, it. It's not going to happen. They've got too much to do already. Yeah, yeah. and your, 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 your problem is your, your business is at risk of you know, contracts that you have that they do have to cite the DFAR clause in them, right? So the government does have to make you aware, but if you're in the business of creating information because of the business that you do, now you're responsible for knowing that. Right. Right, and so and, letting, and also letting the government know. Now there's, so, there's other uh, rule sets you might have to comply with. 
And uh, from what I've seen, and I do the audits, so I know how this goes, um, if a government organization comes in and says, you're compliant with everything except these four rules, um, you don't qualify, you can actually say, yes, we know, but it's, it's mitigated this way. Yep. It's in budget for the next quarter, and here's the date it will be complied with, and you can check with us on that date, and we'll give you our documentation to be updated. If you have a plan to comply, yes. and it's not five years out, <laughs> they're, they're usually pretty nice about it because they, they need to do business too. Yeah, and exactly. if you're an important customer uh, to them, they're going to work with you. Mm -hmm. But you have to show due diligence, yeah, and the I, due diligence, is, that's the hard part. Yeah, and it is, you know, even though the, the clause is what reasonable security, but, but the reasonable security is backed up by a, a lot of guidance a for what is reasonable. Of guidance. <laughs> uh, I think the toughest part of this for me when I first got into it was reading everything before the charts of the guidance, mm. because that's the easy part. Oh, I just need to do these things and these yeah, things. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? But there is, you know, 60 pages before that of here's what we mean yeah. when we say moderate level yeah. of, of, of risk. Here's what we mean by CUI. Here's what we, why we did this. Here's why it's important. Here's what your, your loss could be. And that loss, it, that's an opportunity risk for companies, yeah. right? If, if you lose a contract, you took on that risk when you didn't comply with the rule and there, set. There can be criminal penalty. So, you know, when you sign the contract that has that DFARS clause and your 171 is not up to speed, there can be a criminal penalty for that. that is, that's scary, too. So you could lose money, you could lose your business, you could go to jail. That's right. Wow. Fraudulent. So, tons of good news Great. today. Yeah, everybody. that's not very friendly. <laughs> wow. wow. Anyway, Welcome to doing business with the U.S. The good, the good thing is, there's, you know, there's, there's guidance for what to do, but people need to go do it. That's right. This you is know, the time to do it. It's wide open. There's a website. There's a, tons of people giving information about how to do this, but you got to go do it. So do it today. Okay, everybody, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, we only got a couple seconds left. Thanks for joining us. And next week, we're going to go over some networking scanning with Wireshark with one of our professors Ooh. from a local community college. Okay, until then, stay safe. Right. <laughs>